Hello, everyone. The mics are working. Uh, thank you so much for coming for our today's seminar, which is Money Markets and Monarchies, the Political Economy of the Contemporary Middle East. And our speaker today is Dr. Adam Hanier. Uh, Adam is a reader in development studies at SOAS and an advisory committee member of the Center of Palestinian Studies. His research focuses on the political economy of class and state formation, uh, with a geographical emphasis on the Middle East. He's the author of uh, three books, most commonly uh, Money Market and Monarchies, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and the Political Economy of Contemporary Middle East, which is also the title of our seminar today. And uh, when he wrote his bio, he was shortlisted for the 2019 International Political Economy Group Book Prize uh, of the British International Studies Association. But we found out yesterday that he won the prize. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, and our discussant today is Dr. Jeffrey R. Weber. Uh, Dr. Weber is a political economist with uh, research interests in Latin America, Marxism, social theory, the history of the left, international development, capitalism and nature, uh, imperialism, uh, class, politics, and social, uh, social movements. He's the co-author and author of five books, and currently he's a senior lecturer in the School of Politics and International Relations in Goldsmiths. So, welcome Jeffrey and Adam. Uh, we, the format of the seminar would be um, Adam speaking for about 45 minutes. I'll um, pass you a slip of paper at 40, okay. and then at 45, um, I'll pass you another slip. Uh, and after the 45 minutes, um, we will um, have um, Dr. Weber as the discussant summing up, giving up some points and feedbacks for about five to seven minutes, and then you can choose to reply to that at that point of time. Um, and beyond that, we'll open it up for questions. Okay. So, Great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, I'd like uh, to begin by thanking uh, everyone for coming uh, tonight and the Department of Development Studies, Faisi, and, and the team for organizing uh, uh, this, this seminar series. Uh, I want to present some of the work, uh, some of the ideas uh, from, from the book uh, uh, to you tonight, which looks at the role of the Gulf states uh, in the political economy of the wider, wider Middle East. I wanted to begin by just um, offering some of the motivations uh, and themes of the book, uh, and then turn to some of the findings and arguments that I, I present. Basically, the book starts from a, uh, a long-felt uh, opinion that the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, states, the six states in the Middle East, which I'll speak in a bit more detail about in a second, are quite poorly understood in mainstream uh, coverage of the Middle East uh, and in political debate uh, about the region today. Often the Gulf is uh, reduced simply to the, their uh, oil and gas supplies uh, and the role of these oil and gas supplies in the, in the global economy. Um, the Gulf's role in various wars and conflicts, uh, notably today, of course, uh, in Yemen uh, and, and in Syria, uh, and uh, uh, the kind of uh, following of the ruling family intrigues, different factions of the ruling families um, in, the, in these states. Uh, in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings uh, that began in late 2010, I think it's become patently clear that these six states are, uh, are quite central to the Middle East's uh, future trajectories. But a lot of the discussion around uh, these Gulf states focuses on their mo most overt manifestations of power projection uh, in the region. Uh, and what I was hoping to do in this book is to demonstrate the importance of a, a political economy perspective uh, to these discussions with a focus on the ways that the Gulf's position as a critical site of capitalism in the Middle East uh, is shifting patterns of accumulation throughout the wider region. And that this uh, uh, role in how we understand capitalism in, in, in the Middle East uh, uh, at the regional scale can provide insights into the politics uh, uh, beyond the kind of superficial analysis that often comes with um, gossip about the ruling family, 
uh, uh, or uh, religion, Islam, etc. So theoretically, the book is situated in debates over how to understand the relationship between uh, global processes and the ways that class and state formation play out across the national, regional, and other spatial scales. Many scholars have critiqued the tendency in much of the political economy literature to take for granted the, nation, the national or nation state as the natural geographical unit and vantage point of analysis. What I try to do in the book is to move beyond this kind of methodological nationalism to see how different spatial scales, in particular the regional scale, uh, are produced through cross-border processes. So it's trying to understand how the Gulf's uh, position as a major node of capitalist accumulation in the Middle East is changing the way that the region itself um, is, is operating over, over the last few decades. This doesn't mean and shouldn't be taken to imply that the nation state uh, is no longer important but rather it points to how sub- and supranational processes play an increasingly fundamental role in both the ways that globalization works and in shaping uh, what goes on at the national level, helping us move beyond a kind of state centrism uh, that typifies, I think, much work on the Middle East. So there's two angles that I uh, explore this question from. Uh, first, I, under I, I look at what uh, we can learn about the global from the vantage point of the Gulf. Uh, the Gulf, if, if you think about the ways that uh, people often talk about the Gulf's, um, or oh, sorry, the global political economy today, uh, we, we hear talk about, uh, of, I mean, a focus largely on the United States, potential or relative decline perhaps of US power. Uh, we talk a lot about Europe uh, and increasingly uh, 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 emerging markets and, and the BRICS of course is, is symbolic of, of these kinds of um, emerging, emerging markets. But within this, the Gulf has been typically largely absent. Um, and I think this is a, a real mistake. Uh, we think about uh, the Middle East is kind of left out of these discussions of how the global political economy functions. The term BRICS obviously excludes the Gulf. Um, uh, or the region is simply reduced to, to, oil, um, to its oil exports. So what I try to do in, in part of the book is to show how uh, flows of Gulf financial surpluses are an essential component to understanding the contemporary world market, uh, to understand these kinds of patterns of uh, uh, persistent levels of overaccumulation, uh, the predominance of US and, and Europe uh, continuing predominance as core zones of power, but the emergence of new centers of accumulation and political rivalries. Uh, and I think Having finished this book, um, uh, uh, it's actually, I think, becoming even more uh, of a topic. We can see, I think, in the last uh, six months or so, uh, the, 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 the shifting relationships between Asia, East Asia, China, and uh, the Gulf, Middle East as a whole, but particularly the Gulf region, which I think is quite interesting. It's actually moved a lot uh, faster than I um, uh, thought initially uh, in, in, in the book. Um, this is not just a matter of adding another case study um, to how we understand global processes. It's about seeing the global in and through its relationship to the Gulf. By understanding the relation, um, uh, this relationship between the global and the Gulf and the Gulf's place in the making of the global, I think we can gain some insights into the nature of, of global capitalism um, itself. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this. Perhaps uh, Jeff might want to pick up with these topics uh, or we could talk about it more. But I want to turn more to the, 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 the second kind of uh, uh, relationship that the book explores, which is to try to understand how the Gulf um, has, uh, the Gulf's location within the global has been articulated through shifting patterns of accumulation in the wider, wider Middle East. Um, and before I do that, I just want to make a few comments about, about the Gulf itself for people who are perhaps unfamiliar of, um, with, this, with this part of the world. So uh, these, I'm, I'm talking here, I mentioned the Gulf Cooperation Council, the six states here highlighted in green, um, uh, dominated by uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, the largest uh, of, of the Gulf states. Uh, uh, we, these, these states have... Uh, are marked by a number of features um, that set them apart from the rest of the Arab uh, world. They are all monarchies um, whose uh, rich and relatively cheap hydrocarbons, that's oil and gas, uh, uh, make the Gulf, have made the Gulf for uh, many decades a critical focus of Western strategy in the Middle East um, throughout the 20th century. 
uh, with the emergence of the United States as a dominant uh, power in, in, in the wake of uh, the Second World War, the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia, uh, developed as a major pillar of American uh, foreign policy in the region. And this is part, I think, of uh, perhaps how we need to look at the, the emerging relations with the East um, uh, over the last, uh, last few years, what, how, what this might mean for US power um, in the region. Uh, in 1981, uh, these six states joined together in a kind of security umbrella um, that had both economic and political aspects to it as well, called the, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, the US uh, led uh, invasions of Iraq in 1991 and 2003, were largely um, uh, uh, carried out uh, through a military presence um, in the GCC states, and today a wide array of US troops and military um, installations are located in, uh, in these areas, including naval bases in Bahrain and um, uh, the forward command of US Central Command in, in Qatar, as well as other bases uh, in the area. At the same time, the Gulf monarchies uh, differ quite significantly uh, from other states in the Middle East. And I think one of the, the most significant aspects of this is the Gulf's reliance on a very uh, uh, a large number of temporary migrant workers, mostly drawn from uh, South Asia uh, and to a lesser degree uh, the Arab world. Uh, these migrant workers make up now more than 50% of the Gulf's um, total population of 56 million uh, people. Uh, when considered as part of the labor force in the Gulf, uh, uh, these, these figures are even more uh, Stark. Uh, we find that migrant workers uh, range from over 59% uh, to 86% of the employed population in Saudi Arabia, Oman, Bahrain, and Kuwait, to around 92 to 95% of the populations uh, in Qatar and the UAE. Quite a remarkable figure when you think about it. Less than 10% um, of the population in these states actually holding uh, citizenship. Now, these uh, workers are denied labor, political, and civil rights, um, and they've been fundamental, I think, to uh, part of the story that I, I try to tell in the book, um, which is the patterns of urban growth and capital accumulation in, in the Gulf states. Um, there's a lot, again, that can be said about this, but again, I'll, I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll leave this um, further to discussion. Now, this, uh, these, uh, these Gulf states, uh, should not be, despite the fact they're, um, they're in this kind of regional integration project of the GCC, they should not be taken to be all precisely the same. There's a lot of differences and internal rivalries between them, most importantly uh, between Saudi Arabia uh, uh, and uh, the UAE on one side is a major pole of, of power in the GCC and Qatar uh, on the other um, that's emerged in the last uh, few, few years. Um, but I think key to the story that I, I'm trying to tell here is what's happened um, essentially since the early 2000s, where we've seen uh, uh, an increasing demand for the Gulf's um, hydrocarbon exports uh, and a near continuous 15-year uh, increase in the price of oil uh, up till about mid-2014, which led to a massive expansion in the quantities of surplus capital held by both private and state-owned firms um, in the Gulf. So uh, I try to map this surplus capital and the capital accumulation. Um, conservatively, we're talking about well over $6 trillion um, accumulating in the region uh, by governments and sovereign wealth funds and private firms and individuals. Uh, in 2016, $6 trillion. This is a level that has massively increased um, since the early 2000s. And what this has uh, been central to is a process of, of capitalist uh, class formation where we see large uh, conglomerates um, that are closely connected to the state, um, benefit from uh, contracts uh, 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 provided by the state, uh, that dominate most of um, uh, uh, business processes uh, in the region. We're talking about activities such as construction and real estate, um, uh, 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 industrial processes, steel, aluminium and concrete, uh, retail processes, shopping centers and malls, and of course, uh, banking and finance. Um, so I try to present a, some, a map of actually these different sectors, who are the dominant conglomerates and how they've emerged um, um, through, this, uh, through the last uh, uh, two decades. Now, this surplus capital accumulating in the Gulf 
um, has mostly historically and continues today mostly to be invested in North America uh, and Europe. Um, uh, 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 where we can see Gulf firms taking uh, stakes in a lot of household names, Twitter, uh, uh, Barclays Bank, of course, is being uh, part of an inquiry that's happening now in the UK around investment from Qatar. Uh, we can see it in the uh, largest uh, provider of nursing homes in the UK, for example, is actually owned, is a Gulf-owned uh, firm. Um, we can see it in real estate uh, and, and many different um, sectors. Football clubs is obviously another one. Um, but so North, what I'm trying, what I'm going to say in the next part of this presentation should not be taken to, Im to imply that North America and Europe aren't continuing to be the major um, areas where these Gulf um, capital flows um, have, have focused. But what we have seen through the 2000s and continuing today is increasing amounts of, of investments that have flowed into neighbouring Arab countries um, uh, uh, over this period. Now, this, uh, these capital flows were predicated upon the adoption of structural adjustment uh, packages in places like Egypt, Jordan, uh, uh, Tunisia, uh, uh, and, and elsewhere through the 1990s and 2000s, the liberalization and opening up um, of these Arab economies. Um, and as a result of these kinds of reforms, Gulf capital took a major stake and was a primary beneficiary of the neoliberal turn that occurred um, uh, uh, through the last, uh, the last two decades. And this, I think, tells us something about neoliberalism in the Arab world um, that is not immediately apparent when we think of neoliberalism as bound or enclosed within these uh, kind of state-centric frameworks. In other words, um, it is certainly true if we look at, at a place like Egypt that neoliberal reforms, um, which were a major part in the uprisings that uh, overthrew Mubarak in 2011 and the demonstrations that continue today in Egypt, uh, it's certainly true that these neoliberal reforms uh, played a big part uh, in enriching uh, the Mubarak uh, regime, crony capitalists, if you want to use that term, uh, connected to the regime, obviously the, the Egyptian military. But the other side to the story that often gets missed is that it was Gulf, uh, uh, Gulf investments, including by both private and state uh, uh, firms, entering into Egypt that uh, became, if you like, interiorized in the class structure of uh, the Egyptian state. So when we think about Egyptian capital, we can't just talk about um, uh, Egyptian as a nationality. We need to think about the ways that the regional uh, hierarchies were also formed um, and the Gulf became a major beneficiary of this kind of um, opening up. Now, uh, this is not just simply true in terms of the ownership of capital. Uh, it is also it means that when we think about development processes in place, places like Egypt, we think about the ways that citizens or, or the populations in, in, in these countries relate to the state, relate to the political economy, we can look at how the Gulf has become a major intermediary between Arab populations and, uh, uh, and, and the market itself. Um, and this has important ramifications for social and economic um, development, and not to mention uh, political, uh, political alliances. Um, okay, so I want to just give some, uh, 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 give some examples here uh, to, to illustrate what I, I, I'm saying. So I'm, I'm going to run through a few sectors which uh, I look at in a lot more detail um, in the book, um, beginning with agricultural production um, and agribusiness. Now, this is, I think, a really interesting uh, sector because we, when we think about the Gulf, we don't normally think of the Gulf as being an agricultural producer. Uh, uh, we think of it as being an oil exporter. Obviously, it is an oil exporter. Um, but uh, there are uh, major uh, uh, internationally known firms, agribusiness firms, that are Gulf-owned and are headquartered in uh, various Gulf states, in particular Saudi Arabia, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and, and, and uh, Kuwait. These firms, uh, over the last two decades, uh, have been very involved in the purchase of land um, uh, throughout the Middle East and also uh, other parts of, of the world, Africa um, and even North America. Um, uh, but even beyond the land grabs that have been attracted quite a lot of attention, uh, uh, these kind of Gulf land grabs, uh, it's interesting to look at the way that supply chains, agricultural supply chains, um, uh, are dominated by Gulf 
owned firms in the Middle East, um, as well as uh, 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 all the way up to the actual sale of products, retail, retail, retailing of, of agricultural products um, in the region. So if we look at Egypt, for example, close to half of the food and agricultural companies that are listed on the country's stock exchange are either controlled or have significant ownership stakes held by Gulf-based um, capital firms. Now, Egypt has been the primary focus of this kind of internationalization of Gulf capital. Um, uh, uh, but other countries are also being drawn uh, into Gulf agribusiness circuits. Uh, circuits. So in Jordan, uh, the leading companies involved in dairy farming, fruit and vegetable production, processed meats, edible oils and minerals, mineral water are all Gulf owned. Uh, similarly in Lebanon, Gulf based firms hold controlling or major stakes in the largest dairy producer, one of the top ice cream and juice companies. Grain mill and, uh, a grain mill and silo uh, compound with the highest storage capacity of any mill in the country. The biggest nut retailer in the Middle East, um, which uh, might sound strange, but uh, this is quite a, I like this example because this company appears to, I mean, everyone thinks of it as being a Lebanese owned company. Uh, when you go to uh, the airport in, in Beirut, you see this company or em emblazoned around the place, stores selling it. This is a Lebanese product. It's actually uh, Kuwaiti owned, um, this, this firm. Uh, uh, and uh, leading supermarket chains and, and so forth. Now, all of these firms, they produce for domestic Arab markets, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, and so forth, um, as well as for export to the Gulf. And what this means, and this is relatively new, we're talking about a two decade uh, uh, process, it means that. Policies that promote food security in the, in the Gulf, which, have, which food, the idea of food security um, has been uh, the major plank of uh, uh, Gulf uh, agricultural planning since about 2007, 2008, with the spike in food prices, global food prices that happened at that moment. So all Gulf states have put forward food security uh, as their major, uh, uh, major uh, food policy. Um, but what this, 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 this policy has meant has, uh, is that the Gulf's food security um, actually is, is, a, is a discourse that has justified this expansion of Gulf uh, investments around, um, around the rest uh, of, of the region. So we see agricultural production, the circulation and consumption um, uh, of food uh, 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 shifting um, through uh, the, the changes to the Gulf agricultural um, policies. Now, I don't mean to imply here that this is true across every single country in the region. Um, if we look at places like Morocco and Tunisia, these are much more tightly linked to European markets, but it is shifting regional patterns of trade, agricultural trade, the types of agro-commodities produced, and the structures of ownership and control uh, within the sector. Now, a second uh, very important uh, sector is, is urban uh, development, uh, real estate development, construction. Um, and here again, we can see that the nature of the Arab city, uh, the nature of urban development in the Arab world, uh, is, is largely uh, interlaced with the dynamics of accumulation that come from the Gulf uh, states. So if we look uh, here, Okay, so this, this is a, a table that looks at um, real estate projects in uh, six major uh, Arab countries between 2008 to 2017. Um, it, it lists uh, the number of projects that are worth more than $100 million. Uh, so these are major uh, uh, mega projects, if you like. Um, uh, I'm not talking about a small apartment, I'm talking about large uh, 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 tourism resorts, shopping malls, um, large uh, large buildings. Uh, uh, you can see the government-owned projects and you can see in the third column GCC-related projects. So these are projects that are owned, developed or built by GCC uh, uh, firms. Um, you can see the value of the project um, and uh, the last column I think uh, uh, is, is the most important which shows you the value, uh, the total value of GCC related projects, uh, or GCC related projects as a percentage of total uh, value. We can see that uh, in uh, all of these states uh, that uh, a significant proportion, uh, a very significant proportion of 
large real estate projects are owned in this way um, through, uh, through uh, Gulf-based uh, companies. Uh, I'll come back in a second to why this, I think this is important. Um, if we look, uh, this, so these are the big projects that are you know, tendered and, and publicly available uh, information. Uh, perhaps even more interesting, I think, uh, this kind of brings me back to the point I made a little bit earlier when we think about capital development um, at the national level. Here are uh, five uh, states, and I'm looking here at the listed real estate firms um, on the stock markets of each of these, uh, uh, these countries. So these are firms, if you went to Egypt or Jordan uh, or Palestine or so forth, uh, you would think of them as being Jordanian firms or Egyptian firms, uh, their household names as being the big uh, locally owned uh, firms in, in, these, in these countries. Uh, the second column shows you their connection to GCC capital. So this is like a minimum 20% ownership um, of GCC uh, uh, investments, uh, in most cases more than that 20%. Um, and you can see that, uh, uh, again, around about one-fifth um, of these firms are in some way connected to the GCC. This is a, a trend that has shifted uh, or has increased uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 or so years. Um, that these, uh, the ownership of these firms uh, uh, has become more and more interlaced with, uh, with, Gulf, um, with Gulf investors. Now, why is this important? Um, it means that uh, the key tenets of urban planning um, in, in many Arab cities uh, and the policies that are very familiar uh, across the world, privatization of, 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 of land and public housing, the lifting of rent caps, the uh, growth of mortgage markets, um, private provision of infrastructure services, all of these kinds of things are actually mediated through uh, Gulf, uh, Gulf uh, uh, in investments. Um, and it's, it's I think, uh, 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 something that we can see uh, evident across uh, many, uh, many Arab states. Um, moving along, this is actually my, uh, one of my favorite uh, examples, which is telecommunications. So this is looking across these two pages, uh, 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 I think 10 uh, Arab states, um, and it look, it's looking at the uh, telecommunication ownership of telecommunications firms. Um, the ones in yellow are, are Gulf owned. Uh, the first line are the fi oh, sorry, the second column is uh, fixed line operators. So kind of uh, the old, uh, previously largely state owned telecoms, some of which have been privatised um, recently. But more importantly. Uh, the second column, the mobile license operators. Um, and you can see here that, uh, 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 there, and in brackets, that's the market share that these, um, these telecoms actually, actually have. Um, and you can see that Iraq, Jordan, Morocco, Tunisia, GCC-owned telecoms control the largest share of the entire uh, mobile market. Um, and there is no country, apart from Syria and Libya, uh, in which case that the, the GCC uh, uh, Gulf telecoms do not own uh, or operate at least one um, mobile, uh, mobile license. Now, why, why do I find this interesting? It's not just because when you make a phone call uh, that there's a Gulf-based telecom ultimately at the end of, of, of where um, the, the, the profits from that um, telecommunications occur. I think, again, it has policy. It's related to how uh, urban spaces are, uh, uh, are planned. Um, these telecoms, um, and this is true very much in the Gulf, have been major, uh, uh, have taken up, again, part of, as part of the global move around smart cities, uh, surveillance in infrastructures, um, uh, and, and you can see that if we see uh, those policies kind of unfold, and they certainly are unfolding in parts of the, in many of these countries, that it's actually Gulf-based telecoms who will be leading the development and implementation of these kinds of infrastructures, urban infrastructures, um, particularly around um, surveillance. Um, so I, I think this is, uh, this is quite uh, 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 revealing. Um, final, the final sector uh, I wanted to quickly talk about is uh, uh, finance and banking. Um, uh, I, maybe I'll leave this uh, 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 Thing, but I'll move to the, this slide here, which is the Arab uh, banking system. This is from 2017. Looks at the total number of banks in each of these uh, countries, the number that are uh, GCC related in the fourth column there. 
Um, and you can see again that there's a very high proportion um, of, of banks in Jordan, for example, 86% of the country's banks in Jordan are um, actually uh, uh, owned by uh, GCC uh, financial <laughs> firms. Okay, uh, again, a very, a very significant, uh, a very significant figure. Um, this is, this is uh, important because again, the policies that we've seen uh, that promote growth of the financial sector, that promote um, mortgage mortgage markets, that that in promote financialization are again intermediated by GCC uh, financial institutions. So when we think about financialization, it's not something that's just occurring uh, within these individual countries. These banks, if we look at their names, they appear as a Jordanian bank, a Lebanese bank, an Egyptian bank, but ultimately um, it is the Gulf-based financial firms that are um, involved in this kind of um, accumulation. Now, all that I've said should not be taken to imply that uh, this is some kind of predatory takeover by the Gulf of the rest of the Arab world. That's not the argument I'm trying uh, uh, to make. In many cases, Arab capitalist groups um, in these, co these countries have benefited significantly um, from their connection to the Gulf and have actually uh, headquartered themselves um, in, in, in the GCC. Um, GCC, Non-GCC Arab firms now view the Gulf as an important area of economic activity, uh, particularly in areas like construction, uh, logistics, um, and retail. But taken as a whole, these trends reveal how neoliberal reforms in many Arab countries has, have been both reinforced by and predicated upon the internationalization um, of, of Gulf capital. The rollout of structural adjustment project uh, packages in the, in the 1990s and 2000s didn't just transform uh, social, political and economic power within the borders of individual Arab countries, it's marked by new hierarchies um, at the regional scale. So um, to, to give you some examples of, of why I think this is important, when we look for example at Jordan, uh, where there has been a major push to uh, get uh, Jordanian citizens into financial markets to borrow money uh, for mortgage uh, on mortgage mortgage lending uh, and to use that to purchase houses. Um, this has been a major financial push of financial institutions in the last um, decade or so. Um, that that appears to be something at the surface that is a Jordanian process. Okay, the largest mortgage uh, uh, provider in Jordan uh, is. Uh, a well-known housing bank of trade and finance, um, a well-known Jordanian bank. But if we look a, dig a bit deeper, that bank is actually uh, owned by majority, uh, fully owned by a Qatari and Kuwaiti uh, uh, partnership. Okay, so it is this, it is a Qatari and Kuwaiti firms that are mediating the relationship between Jordanian citizens and financial markets in, through the through the housing through the housing um, through the housing sector. When uh, residents of Beirut uh, or, or Egypt protest around uh, the lifting of rent controls um, in their capital cities or uh, around the attempts to clear out um, slum, uh, slum dwellers in, in, in these states, informal housing communities, um, they are not just confronting national urban policy, they are also confronting the ways that the priorities of urban development have been increasingly subordinated to the accommodation of, of, of Gulf-based um, Gulf firms. And when Moroccans and Tunisians access the internet, they do so through five subsea cables um, that are uh, connected to the global internet backbone. And this critical infrastructure is again predominantly controlled by uh, Gulf firms. So this is, the, uh, this is I think, the, the key uh, uh, argument um, that I'm trying to make is that Gulf capital has become uh, a major, uh, has, ha, plays a major part in making the making of how social relations in, in the region um, uh, un, un, unfolds. Now, um, I don't have time, and again, this is something we can, uh, we can perhaps uh, look at more in discussion, um, but I think all of this can tell us something very interesting about the, uh, the politics um, of, the world, of the region today. Um, it tells us, for example, uh, I think a lot about where reconstruction, um, post-conflict reconstruction uh, might go. Because if we look at a place like Yemen, for example, 
Um, the firms that I've talked about here, the banks, the construction firms, the infrastructure, telecommunications firms, all of these kinds of large uh, uh, companies will play undoubtedly a major role um, in the rebuilding uh, of Yemen, post-conflict reconstruction in Yemen. Um, uh, we can see this already in the case of Egypt, we can see it in the case of Tunisia and in the case of Jordan. Um, so uh, I think when we talk about conflict, uh, we talk about who are the, 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 uh, the ones who will benefit from this kind of reconstruction. Um, uh, Gulf-based firms are both, uh, the Gulf is both uh, a primary uh, uh, antagonist in the conflict, very clearly in the case of Yemen, but also will likely structure the ways that reconstruction and development um, take place uh, 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 as in the end of cessation of, 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 of formal violence. So um, uh, it's trying to understand, I think, how this development of the regional scale um, uh, will, I think, further project the various Gulf states as key actors um, within the region into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adam. You were 10 minutes before time. Um, we will now hand over to Jeff for about 10 minutes, should we say? Sure. Um, sure. Right. OK, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be here. I'm delighted to uh, speak uh, and celebrate Adam's new book. Um, I was thinking about it on the on the train over, and and it I recalled a a conversation um, about a decade ago. Uh, it was a dark, rainy, cold midwinter in London, in some depressed pub, in which I was getting drunk with a small group of melancholic Marxist intellectuals, as one does, and. Um, the question was raised amongst us, um, could we think of anyone under the age of 60 uh, who, had, who was engaged in a sustained research agenda that was going to produce real, lasting, meaningful work under the age of 60? And our list was really dismally small, uh, which made the evening even brighter. Um, I think a decade later, um, that list has gotten somewhat, somewhat bigger. I don't want to exaggerate it, but, the, but there's been a renewal of interest in, in Marxism. And I think you can see this in, um, in perhaps most innovatively, in, in Marxist feminism and in work on ecology. Um, but I think this latest book of Adams, if it's understood as part of the trilogy of books on uh, Middle East capitalism, which are all about more than Middle East capitalism, I think this constitutes another uh, figure on still a small list. Um, not only that, but I think this book, as good as the other two were, uh, raises the bar to a new level of sophistication, uh, theoretically and uh, philosophically, methodologically, not just in terms of political economy. Um, and I should say that I'm not an expert on the Middle East, so maybe they're not that good, but I, I'm not an expert on the Middle East, but um, it's not just because of uh, incompetence that I'm going to focus my um, comments on, on method and theory. It's also because Adam uh, stresses in the book a hostility, I think, which is, which is uh, well-founded to uh, methodological nationalism and to the kind of stress on theories that want to emphasize the uh, exceptionalism of the Middle East, how everything in the Middle East uh, deserves a particular explanation, uh, and so ideas like capitalism and class um, are often under understated relative to other various culturalist or institutionalist explanations of different types that emphasize the particularity of these things. 
So I want to stress in, in focusing, on, focusing on method and slightly more abstract themes that um, usefully Adam downplayed in, the, in his talk today, um, the, the sort of universal importance and impact of this, of this book beyond uh, area studies. Um, so the book, what the book is about, I'm not going to go through this because Adam just, just summarized the, the, the core <coughs> basic arguments, but the theoretical axes as I see it, that it hinges around and that I want to focus on are, are scale, um, internal relations, and, um, and totality. So it departs first from Lefebvre on, on the notion of scale that, um, that stresses that uh, capital accumula accumulation is always territorialized in particular ways, um, and that space is produced in and through processes of capital uh, circulation and accumulation. And he moves this, therefore, much beyond the discussion of, of merely uh, the, the, the so-called supersession or decline of the relevance of the nation state uh, in, in neoliberal globalization or uh, those who take the opposite position that the state has uh, retains its significance uh, and so on. Of course, Adam doesn't uh, ignore the nation state, but it's the transformation of the national form in relationship to these other scales that becomes much more important. Much more, much more important. And the co-constitutive relations across these different scales uh, and their internal relations with one another and the processes of class formation and state formation um, inside of these multiple scales uh, that, uh, that is the driving theoretical emphasis. And I think what's interesting here is that, uh, unlike Adam, uh, I, uh, I have found most of the critical geographical literature, apologies to critical geographers in the room and so on, but it, it, pretty deadly uh, in, in recent years. I mean, the, the notion of space and, and scale has been, um, for me, largely empty vessels doing little theoretical uh, work. Uh, and I think Adam underplays the way that he gives life, he gives a, new, a renewed life to these, to these ideas by connecting them to internal relations and totality so that they actually are doing work that, in my view, um, was absent from, from uh, obviously not true of Lefebvre, but he goes a long way back. I'm talking about the contemporary debates in critical geography. So by internal relations, he moves to uh, Bertel Ullman and this philosophy of internal relations in which you, you remove the idea that objects and concepts are self-contained and that they then collide with one another as external relations but rather that the relations between objects are themselves fundamental to the nature of those objects. So you focus on the relations between them as being constitutive to the, to the makeup of objects. So if you focus on relations between objects and the changing relationship between objects over time, you'll see that the changes in relationship between them changes the objects themselves. Okay? Now, it's one thing, as Bertel Ullman does very effectively, to defend this idea of philosophy of internal relations on its own. It's quite an audacious thing to then try to uh, empiricize this uh, empirically. It's much more difficult to do than to say that this, this, this is true uh, in philosophical terms. Um, but the way that uh, this is done in, in Adam's work is to think about the global through the concept of uh, of totality in, in particular. And so I just want to read one, uh, one section here which comes in the uh, introduction on what he means by totality. Quote, here my, here my approach emphasizes the notion of the totality, the whole, which arises through the interaction of its parts. This whole, however, should not be seen as a simple aggregate of individual bits in which the sum of all the small scale parts produces the large scale total, Rather, the totality emerges as something more than its parts, a structural, evolving, self-forming whole. And here he's quoting the Czech philosopher Karol Kosick. And it's typical of, of Adam in this book and, and, the, and the 
the sort of uh, innovative character of it and the far-reaching reading behind it, that he comes at the question of Gulf capital through an engagement with Hegelian Marxism via the Czech philosopher Karol Klosik, who he engaged through uh, Dale Tomic in a study of colonial slavery and the sugar circuit of capitalism in 16th century uh, emergence of the world market. That's how we enter this, this, um, this discussion. Um, and what that notion of totality does is not just say that the totality is something more than the sum of its parts, but he is very careful to stress that that totality should, or, that, or the global should not be reified and held as a scale above that externally relates and determines those scales below it, but rather the coming into being of that, of that, of that global. And in that, in that process then, Adam is focusing on another of the, of, even if he does this implicitly, I mean, there's no, I see it strongly, but he never says this explicitly. He's engaging with um, one of the most uh, uh, newly revived currents of Marxist theory today, which I think is this focus on temporality. The coming into being of the global means that it, it is never this reified thing that then affects things. It is constantly being, being produced and reproduced through the co-constitutive internal relations between these scales. So I'm just going to leave it there. I just wanted to signal those three, those three levels of analysis um, and how that, and then encourage um, Adam to maybe reflect more in the Q&A if he has time. I'm sure there are many other questions. Um, to relate it to the, to, to this discussion of state and capital in a more explicit way maybe than in the, in the introduction. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, Adam, would you like to respond or shall we open the floor up for questions? Okay. Uh, so we shall open the floor up for questions. Uh, we have uh, two volunteers running around with a mic on either side of the room. So if you raise your hands and I can direct them towards you. And we'll, we'll start by taking uh, three questions at a time. Um, and then Adam can respond. So just up there. And there. Yes, taking up the, the concepts which are in the book but lack the time to explain until we got to Jeff. I want to ask how these processes reconstitute national capital, not simply as a rival, as you hinted, it's, it's not simply a rivalry with the, the Gulf investment, it's some kind of re new relationship and perhaps dependency. And then what does it mean for the nation state, even those states which seem to be relatively independent before this process, such as Egypt, where the, the military was the major owner of industrial commercial assets. What, what does it mean for now to speak about the state in these countries? Okay. My, uh, my question is about the, um, if you took a look at the the tech and tech investment uh, sector as as a you know relatively perhaps smaller sector than some of the ones that you had mentioned, but um, on on two levels, one one on Gulf capital fueling um, the, the the global um, uh, tech race. I mean, probably most uh, recently the uh, investment by the Saudi sovereign wealth fund into the Vision Fund and. You could argue, perhaps, that it even led to the uh, the situation with WeWork that we have today, with the the abundance of capital and and uh, uh, and, and everything that had, had had resulted. But at the same time, there's the the Gulf capital that also fuels the uh, the technology sector within the within the Middle East uh, and within the non-Gulf uh, MENA region, which which has a different type of impact and and is actually the so the the number one source of growth capital for these types of nascent firms in the region. So I wonder if you took a look at that from the two different aspects. Thank you, and Alessandra right in the front. Yeah. I have a yeah. mic. 
Thank you. Thanks, Saram. That was uh, really uh, great presentation skills to actually give us a sense of what the book is about. And uh, I think I have two questions, and one perhaps draws on some of Jeff's uh, uh, comments, and I really appreciated a lot the presentation. One is, uh, if you can give us a sense of uh, how easy it is for non-GCC Arab capital to move to GCC as headquarters, because in a sense that qualifies the argument of uh, the role of GCC capital in the region versus the GCC as a spatial node of capitalist accumulation in the world economy. Um, and the second question, uh, perhaps related uh, to some of the issues that Jeff raised, is instead what you think is the contribution of your work uh, to uh, recent debates on the role of circulation in capital accumulation, because it's a huge uh, historical work on the Arab Peninsula as there is on Indian Ocean trade that actually point at how commercial capitalism is the vantage point through which we should understand some processes that constitute uh, uh, global capital formations today. So I'm thinking of the work of Jairus Banerjee, but also more historical work like the margins of the market, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Sure. Um, yes, <clears throat> thank you. They're very good questions. And uh, yeah, it, it, the, the, some of them actually, are, my responses are going to overlap a little bit to some of these. Um, I think the way Alessandra uh, phrased it is actually a very good way of saying it, that this, the GCC uh, is an important spatial zone uh, of, capitalist, uh, of, of capitalism, if we think about capitalism um, in the Middle East. Uh, so what, is, what, what we can notice, and I didn't get a real chance to expand on this, um, but also it relates to the, the first question, uh, we can see that many Arab, uh, uh, large Arab firms, um, particularly post-2011, uh, uh, and, and the uprisings that took place since that time, uh, have moved themselves from uh, their local countries, their domestic countries, uh, and have either uh, established themselves uh, in, the, in different GCC states, um, listed themselves on GCC stock, stock markets, in particular uh, Dubai is a big one here, um, uh, or have uh, uh, their major accumulation is actually taking place um, in the Gulf. Even though uh, there's an example here, uh, you know, Egyptian Oriscom, one of the, large, the biggest uh, construction firm in Egypt, a well-known uh, Egyptian firm uh, that is now uh, jointly listed, I believe, and perhaps headquartered in, in Dubai. Um, and most of its projects take place in the Gulf. Um, so we see that uh, Arab capital has certainly um, become more and more uh, dependent upon or linked uh, 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 to its relationship with accumulation um, in, in the Gulf states. Um, uh, so I, I don't want to imply, um, as I said, I don't want to imply this is like a hostile takeover um, uh, and it's not a kind of a dependency argument in that, in that kind of sense. It's a way of looking at how does the nature of capital accumulation change when we think about uh, accumulation within the region at that regional uh, uh, scale. So that's one example, the, these kinds of firms that are large Arab uh, conglomerates that now uh, are centrally headquartered in the Gulf. Um, the other very important example, and it relates to the final uh, comments I was making about post-conflict reconstruction, uh, the diaspora bourgeoisies that have been displaced through uh, war and conflict. Um, so we can think here about uh, Palestinian capitalist class um, is a very, very clear example of this. Uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, okay. Uh, uh, we can see uh, large, uh, they, they often have both a Palestinian uh, citizenship as well as a Gulf citizenship, okay, which is if if you look at uh, the policies of citizenship in the Gulf, is almost impossible to achieve. Okay, so what has happened is that the ruling families in the Gulf have said, okay, this person 
um, is an important ally politically and economically um, and have granted that person citizenship. <coughs> Hariri in Lebanon is the classic example, holds Saudi citizenship. Abu Mazen, the Palestinian uh, 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 Prime Minister, President, is, uh, has Qatari citizenship. Um, you look at uh, uh, the key political leaders in Palestinian politics, they're all very close to uh, different ruling families um, in the region, particularly in Abu Dhabi. Uh, there's a number of examples we can trace out here. So this kind of diaspora bourgeoisie um, that may have citizenship in both places, but is, is um, uh, located uh, in, in the Gulf region. Um, uh, connected to this, and this comes back to the, the first question as well, um, about uh, how is national capital getting uh, reconstituted. Uh, I think if you look at somewhere like Egypt, um, is a very good example. You look at in the last, since about 2015, 2016, uh, the, the coming to power of Sisi, uh, backed very strongly by uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, we can see Saudi Arabia making a very uh, determined effort to uh, uh, build uh, its links with Egyptian capital, the Egyptian military, which is long standing, but also, spatially, it's really interesting. The Red Sea project, I think, is a, is a really ex interesting example where Saudi Arabia basically now sees the Red Sea Canal and the Egyptian uh, coast of the Red Sea and the Saudi coast of the Red Sea as being a single uh, zone under Saudi control. Um, so there are plans to build bridges across the, both sides, both coasts. Uh, joint um, uh, development projects, agribusiness projects, um, uh, all of these things that have been pushed through uh, uh, the Egyptian parliament, uh, despite the fact that the Egyptian population is, is largely hostile to them. Um, but it's really a, a, a really a redrawing of, of the map of how uh, uh, Egypt, um, national capital in Egypt um, is, is constituted. The other, uh, I think, important part um, of all of this is, of course, illicit flows that go through the Gulf. Um, so this is, again, Dubai is where, where, where this really stands out, where we can see, um, not just in the Middle East, but uh, uh, in uh, uh, parts of Central Asia, parts of Africa, uh, uh, where the, Dubai is kind of a, a, a rerouting of these kind of illicit financial flows um, uh, and from Dubai it goes into either the real estate sector in Dubai or elsewhere or, or gets cleaned and then goes somewhere else. Um, so a very good example of this uh, is the Gupta family um, in South Africa uh, who uh, was you know, very part of this in ongoing investigation in South Africa to state capture um, and basically uh, they fled to uh, the UAE. Um, in the last year or so. Uh, 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 but we can see it in Pakistan, we can see it in Afghanistan, we can see it in Thailand. We can, I mean, all of these people who flee their countries um, or are still there and still making illicit gains um, are rooting this through, um, rooting this through the, the Gulf. Um, the, uh, the, question, the tech sector I, I is really interesting. Uh, and I think I begin the book actually with the SoftBank example. Because um, the vision, the SoftBank is a huge... Uh, 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 firm that invests primarily in like tech startups. It was a, it's a Japanese uh, firm, but vis the Vision Fund, which is a fund owned by SoftBank, um, its I, I, its major investors are Saudi Arabia, and I think also the UAE recently have come into this as well. UAE Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, so they are the biggest investors in in WeWork, um, but as well as a number of other startups uh, or, or major major. Uh, for, I think. Uh, I forget the, the quote now, but it's something like the biggest uh, private equity fund in history, um, SoftBank. Uh, uh, so it's really an in indication. And the, the Saudi Arabia is not a passive investor in this. You know, they are um, part of determining what is happening to a company like WeWork today. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, there are other kind of, again, often private equity firms that are headquartered in the Gulf that have played a more regional role um, in, in, kind of, um, in kind of tech startups as well. Uh, I think this relates to this question of telecom ownership too, uh, because a lot of these, uh, a lot of the obviously web-based development, internet-based uh, uh, applications are connected to um, telecom, telecommunications firms. Um, uh, so uh, the, 
the role, yeah, the circulation, uh, circula circulatory kind of capital, is, it's, it's very, very important. And that's why when I talked about, for example, agribusiness, um, it's not simply the ownership of land, which is where the Gulf often gets reduced to, you know, land grabs in Africa. Actually, if you look at the land grabs uh, or purchases of land uh, by the Gulf, there are certainly uh, uh, investments in, in Sudan and, and um, uh, other African states, but a major part of this is actually European states. Um, it's Canada. You know, the Canadian Wheat Board is now Saudi-owned. Um, uh, when it was privatized, it was bought by a Saudi firm. Um, uh, alfalfa production, uh, which is used to feed uh, uh, dairy, product, dairy cows in um, Abu Dhabi, uh, it, uh, is alfalfa uh, is produced uh, in California, I think it's California, or a US uh, state. Um, uh, uh, the largest uh, grain mill in, or the oldest grain mill in uh, Greece is uh, UAE owned, you know. So these are, these are the, the investments in land um, are not, as we typically often think, um, just in poorer countries. Um, They're often in European or American or Australian or Canadian um, uh, uh, states. Uh, but it's all along the, the, the supply chain. So it's, it's land, but it's also logistics, owning logistics firms to move these uh, agricultural products. And again, Dubai is a big role of this. So um, you can look at uh, the shipping of agric agricultural products through Dubai, uh, but also uh, uh, air, air, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, airport, Dubai airport is now the busiest airport in the world. Um, it overtook Heathrow uh, a few years ago as the bu busiest airport in the, in the world. So, yeah, this whole kind of linking between East and West um, that the Gulf kind of has pushed itself or portrayed itself to be um, is, is the Gulf is really kind of projecting itself as that kind of, as that kind of um, uh, intermediary node in the circulation, uh, in, in this kind of global circulation. And honestly, I think the, the, the war in Yemen is largely about this. Um, it's, I mean, obviously, Saudi Arabia is worried about the Houthis and, and um, uh, the, 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 the war there itself. But I actually think the biggest kind of strategic goal of the Saudi UAE intervention in Yemen is controlling uh, uh, the coast of East Africa, um, uh, trade uh, with India and, and China as part of the One Belt, One Road initiative. If you look at where Saudi Arabia and UAE, uh, what have they done during the last few years of the war, it's to take over the major ports in Yemen it's, and connect these ports with um, ports and military bases in East Africa. Um, and this is again where this one, uh, this uh, Red Sea project with Egypt fits into this. Um, and this is about circulation. It's about in 10 years' time, who, are, who is going to, con or what's the Gulf's position going to be in these kind of major circulatory uh, routes? Thank you so much, Adam. We take the next three questions. So one right there next to you. Um, Adam, we heard uh, in the, uh, the last decade or so, uh, since the global economic meltdown, uh, a lot about Islamic finance mm. as a, uh, an alleged alternative to uh, the um, Western capitalism. And we heard about certain instruments such as sukuk, etc. So I'm wondering what do you think about uh, it being as an alternative as opposed to as another, just, just another form of capitalism? Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Uh, right there as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Adam, for the presentation. Uh, of course, you had limited time, so you, you chose to focus on probably what people know less about, and that's uh, very clearly what you did. Uh, but I think it's important for the audience also to, to uh, give, uh, take some time and, and uh, explain how the role of, of, uh, of these countries in enforcing the the global capitalist uh, uh, agenda in the region in enforcing, for instance, the IMF conditionalities and all that, the role of their capital in doing so. And also the, the, these connections. I mean, when you identify the, the uh, uh, share of Gulf uh, countries or Gulf-related uh, uh, capital uh, in the various projects, how about the, the Western or whatever companies that are also involved? And therefore, what kind of nexus there is there? I mean, this dimension of the story 
uh, was not in your presentation for the reason I said. I mean, you wanted to focus on what is less known, but I think it's important to, to, to give an idea of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one right there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, I've bought and read your book, and it was brilliant. Uh, learned a great deal from it. Um, I wanted to ask uh, whether or not you could speak about some of the neoliberal legal developments, some of the decisions that ultimately opened up the region uh, to capital investment, but also enabled much of the accumulation uh, that you talk about. Thank you. Shall we take a couple of more questions? And uh, then? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyone? Yes, please. Hi. I just wanted to ask, you talked a little bit about sort of the Red Sea project and local opposition in Egypt, and you mentioned it also in your actual presentation. But could you talk more about how this sort of the spread of Gulf capital has made it harder for local resistance movements to actually push back just in more detail? I don't know if you have case studies or stuff. I've not read the book yet but it would be really useful to get more context on how that plays out in any of the countries you've studied. There's a gentleman in the last row there. Yeah, um, I, just, I wanted to ask about, um, so the contradictory relationship between uh, UAE and Iran and um, what we've been hearing about recently, how um, UAE has been um, security agents have been uh, visiting Iran. I wanted to ask about how that relationship is different and why is it different uh, from Iran to Saudi Arabia, for example, and why the same cooperation hasn't been happening. Um, also, uh, if I wanted, to, I wanted to ask about, um, so the middle class in Egypt um, has benefited historically from the oil um, um, uh, the oil price is going up in the Gulf countries. Uh, that's been happening since the 70s. And, uh, but I wanted to ask about the change in attitudes for that middle class in, e in Egypt towards the Gulf countries because I think there's, there's been a change in attitudes f um, where it, at first it was, it was supporting the Gulf countries and the, 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 based on their enrichment. But um, recently, there has been a change in the middle class perception, in, especially in Egypt, towards those Gulf countries, which uh, I wanted to ask about uh, how would that affect Egypt um, in the future? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, yes. The, yeah, I've, I'm glad uh, you asked about Islamic finance, actually, because I, I think this is a really, uh, really interesting uh, 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 field, actually, um, because it is very often in the literature on Islamic finance, uh, particularly by industry practitioners um, and obviously the people, uh, most people who study even on an academic level, it's really portrayed as being some kind of, um, you know, uh, community, uh, pro-poor, uh, uh, alternative to, to mainstream conventional finance, um, something that is, uh, you know, has a bit more social concern, a bit more concern about social welfare, uh, but you're still allowed to make money. Um, that's kind of the way Islamic finance is, is generally. It's also presented as being less uh, crisis prone. So in 2008, uh, there was this, a lot of discussion about how Islamic finance um, was more resilient to the global crisis uh, because it was, uh, wasn't investing in risky assets. Um, uh, I, I honestly think that's all, it's nonsense. Uh, that if you look at the, uh, the Islamic financial instruments like Sukuk, which is like a bond, uh, the kind of Islamic equivalent of a bond, um, uh, uh, that they are essentially, they play the same role as conventional finance. Um, they're just kind of differently named um, and there's different, different legal structures, but they play essentially the same, the same, kind, of, uh, uh, same kind of role. Um, and uh, if, what, I, what I think is most interesting about Islamic finance uh, is that if you look globally, uh, there are a few core zones of Islamic finance. Malaysia, obviously, historically and continues today to be a big uh, zone of Islamic finance. Uh, but 
you look at the ownership of Islamic banks um, uh, and where Islamic finance deals get done, uh, the Gulf really now is at the, at the top of this globally. Um, and again, Dubai is the center of this in terms of Sukuk offering. Uh, uh, Indonesia's, uh, for example, uh, Indonesia offered a, or, or, uh, offered a Sukuk uh, in a couple of years ago. Uh, it was the largest kind of green, in, green uh, in Sukuk, first green Sukuk in the world. Um, uh, it was listed on the Dubai uh, stock market. Um, so foreign governments who are Muslim majority countries that are off, op opening up this kind of Sukuk, they're listing uh, in places such as uh, Dubai. So what this means is that I think Islamic finance is a vehicle through which the Gulf can actually enter areas um, that, and sectors that it may not necessarily have been that present before. Uh, so Indonesia is a very good example of this. Uh, but you look at, for example, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Sudan, uh, Pakistan, Turkey, uh, these countries that have growing Islamic finance sectors at very different rates. Um, uh, Gulf-owned Islamic banks, often what appear to be local banks, uh, they're actually Gulf-owned Gulf Islamic financial institutions. This is not in any way uh, counterposed or, or contradictory with conventional finance. Um, I think it, you can think of it as, as it's a kind of a comparative religious advantage, you know, being the center of uh, Islam, of Islam uh, having the experience and historical background. Uh, you can promote these kinds of uh, uh, areas um, uh, that go alongside your conventional financial power. Um, so Dubai has uh, set itself, you know, I think it was 2014 or something like that, set itself a policy of becoming the world center of Islamic finance. Um, uh, and you can see that that's, I think, what they've been trying to do. And it's very interesting that uh, mainstream financial institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, um, different UN institutions are promoting uh, Islamic finance um, as an alternative financing structure, uh, Sukuk in particular. So, so uh, again, and they very clear. This is not, you know, they want bond structures that can be both Islamic, have Islamic tranches and uh, 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 conventional uh, structures. Um, yeah, on Gilbert's question, absolutely. The uh, the 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 Gulf has, has played, and particularly, I mean, this is true historically, but it's even more true post 2011, um, has played a major role in ensuring these kind of conditionalities, IMF uh, structural adjustment conditionalities, um, uh, uh, are put in place. Very often, the Gulf is the first uh, port of call. Okay, so the IMF won't invest in Egypt until uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Kuwait have uh, basically extracted an agreement from the, from the Egyptian government um, uh, to implement certain, certain measures. Um, it's interesting that uh, the, the up until, I'm not sure if this is still true, but certainly when I was writing the book it was true, uh, that the largest debt Egypt owes is actually to Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, UAE and uh, Kuwait. Uh, not to the IMF, not to the World Bank. And the reason for this is what these countries have been doing is placing their dollar currency reserves in the central banks of different Arab countries. Um, and, so, and this is a debt, okay? So they place their currency reserves in the Egyptian central bank. They've done it in Yemen. They've done it in Tunisia. Uh, uh, they've done it, I believe, in Jordan and <coughs> perhaps also in Lebanon. Uh, uh, and this means that you have an enormous kind of power over what countries can do. Um, because at any moment you just can pull this money back home uh, and the, the, the prices, pressure on the currencies, uh, um, etc. So, uh, yeah, it, it's very often these kind of conditionalities happen. I, I should say it's not just um, IMF and uh, World Bank. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development is kind of a new actor in the region, uh, a major European uh, uh, financial institution that came in post-2011 and is often partnered with, um, with Gulf uh, firms. The other side to Western capital, and, and it's absolutely true that 
uh, in many sectors, Western capital, particularly in parts of North Africa, Morocco and Tunisia, uh, are, are important, very important here. Um, are, you, you'll find European and American firms predominant in many sectors. Um, uh, but also, I think the other side is uh, the way that the GCC is an important uh, zone for those Western firms too. Uh, I'm not trying to say it's more important than you know European or, or uh, North American investments, but it's clear, for example, in certain sectors like engineering or high-end kind of design, that um, uh, the the Gulf is seen as an important market um, uh, and a kind of resilient market in a kind of in an environment of global um, slump, if you like. Um, okay, uh, neoliberal, uh, the kind of legal. Uh, uh, changes that have taken place. Yeah, there's a whole range of examples you can see. Uh, and what, I, what I've tried to do in the book is kind of connect how these neoliberal policies were, were related to the opening up and then, and then the uh, investment flows that are coming from the Gulf. So if you look at uh, agribusiness, okay, well, agricultural uh, policies, uh, a major thing has been uh, privatization of agricultural land. Uh, 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 e export-oriented agriculture um, policies, um, driving peasants or farmers off their land, um, uh, getting rid of kind of fixed tenancy uh, uh, and low rents um, uh, uh, for agricultural. So all of these things happen. Egypt is the perfect example because it's such an important agricultural producer. Um, and they started in the 80s uh, or even a bit earlier, accelerated uh, through the 90s and, and 2000s. Um, so that's where these kinds of they, these kinds of policies uh, were very much connected at the same time to in, in flows of Gulf capital coming into into Egypt. If you look at uh, urban development sector, you're talking here about uh, lifting of uh, rent caps in in the kind of old capital cities uh, like uh, Amman, Cairo, uh, Beirut, which have happened more recently, or. or uh, and that's about kind of, and privatization of kind of state housing uh, firms in these countries. Uh, uh, you, you're talking about private privatization of infrastructure, um, uh, PPPs around infrastructure, again connected to um, uh, uh, IMF agreements off, or World Bank agreements. Um, yeah, uh, the yeah mobilization against. Uh, yeah, that the yes you asked about the mobilisation of or popular mobilisation. I think it was really interesting in 2011, where you saw uh, a lot of the protests were targeting various corrupt deals that took place. Um, for example, around uh, land sales uh, that were sold off very cheaply um, to different uh, people close to. The uh, you know close to the, in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere, uh, uh, and it was interesting that there were a lot of popular protests about you know we need to bring this to account who are the guilty parties that that did this land these land deals. And then when you dig a little bit deeper, it was actually very often it was uh, Gulf these firms that I've talked about here who were the ones that were buying up this cheap land. Um, in, in, in Cairo and, 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 and elsewhere. Um, but it was obscured. So I, I think there is this kind of, there was a kind of uh, understanding by uh, some of the popular movements that our problem is with the Mubarak regime, um, which is obviously true. But there's a, another layer that was behind the Mubarak regime and closely benefiting from it. I think in the last few years, it's become much clearer uh, uh, partly because of the open support of various Gulf states towards uh, CC uh, and, and other political forces um, in, in the region. That it's, it's much clearer. We saw that in Egypt with the sale of the islands in the Red Sea or the transfer of the islands to Saudi, um, Saudi control. Um, but I, I think it's very important politically if I was to say one thing that I, you know, I hoped the book to do uh, is to say that uh, if we're going to change, if we're going to see real change in the region, then we have to also challenge the position of the Gulf, uh, the Gulf states. Like that's an integral part of how uh, capitalism works. It's not enough to just, you know, look at it at the national at the national level. Um, Iran and the and the UAE, the uh, the. Uh, 
yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, but I would be a bit more, even when we're talking about the UAE, there's differences here too. Like Dubai has historically and continues today to have a much closer relationship um, uh, with Iran. Uh, a lot of this is hard to know the exact details because it's partly, you know, because of the sanctions uh, on Iran. Uh, but if you look at Abu Dhabi, uh, it's much more closely aligned to the Saudi uh, position um, on, on, on Iran. So um, I, I think it's partly a proximity thing. It's partly a historical thing. There are a lot of Iranian uh, business people operating in the free zones uh, in Dubai. When you go down the, you know, the central creek in Dubai, you used to be able to see Dubai, bank, uh, Iranian banks there on the side, etc., of the creek. Um, uh, so there are those historical regions. But in general, I think this is part of the, you know, there, there is a competition taking place for regional hegemony, which Iran is obviously a major part of. And it's uh, the, the Saudi UAE axis is about trying to um, sideline side Iran within this. Um, uh, and then the question about uh, the, the changes around uh, remittances and et cetera since the 1970s. I think it's very interesting to look at uh, the moment, you know, the last big oil boom, the 1970s. Uh, a lot of Egyptian workers, Lebanese, Palestinian, Jordanian workers going to the Gulf, um, working in sectors such as construction, uh, bringing money back home, had a very a lot of important effects on. Uh, uh, Arab city development, etc. Religious effects as well, ideological effects. Um, uh, but the the at that moment, the Gulf's role was sold as being a part of Arab solidarity. You know, we are we are recirculating petrodollars back to the region. This is our brotherly, you know, support for other Arab countries. Um, now. Uh, I don't think that's really the way it's seen, um, uh, and certainly not the way it's 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 portrayed. I, I think among many people who, I mean, it's people the kinds of class fractions that are working in the Gulf are different from what it was. Uh, Arab class fractions working in the Gulf are different from what it was in the 70s. Uh, it's more kind of uh, you know engineers or professional level, uh, and the low wage construction work is much more South Asia. Um, so there has been a shift from Arab to uh, South Asian predominantly and Filipino labor uh, over the la and now more and more Chinese and other uh, Asian workers. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, we are almost towards the end, so we're going to do take the last round of questions now. Uh, so we have a lady up there in the last row. Hi. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I think towards the end of your uh, presentation, you said that the capitalist class, who are the firms who are already existing, would actually, uh, you know, like move towards a post-conflict reconstruction. But as far as I know, the capitalist class mostly makes profit out of conflict. And that's what the capitalist class from Saudi was actually doing in Yemen. They were actually, make, they are still making profit out of this conflict. So why would, if you, it would be great if you could put light on why would they, you know, uh, work towards this post-conflict reconstruction of Yemen. Thank you. Uh, this lady right here. Thank you. Um, my question is around the, whether or not this has anything to do with labor market opportunities and labor relations of the GCC nationals. Um, whether this has opened up any work opportunities, especially in these countries. Uh, earlier this year, I was in Sudan for the field work, and in one of the very sort of rural area, I found one foreign company, which was Saudi. I haven't met any of these people, but I'm wondering whether these newly, you know, the Saudi or GCC companies who are investing in these countries are actually providing opportunities for GCC nationals themselves, or are they just sending people from South Asia or Philippines to take care of these companies? If so, uh, who is actually going from GC? Are they the ones from the conglomerates' families or, you know, more like less, you know, less, uh, like a low, low class, I mean, low class or middle class people from these countries? Thank you. And right there, and Fezzi, after that. 
Thanks, thanks Adam. I wanted to rejoice and celebrate, but there cannot not be a question about migration when it comes to the Gulf. And, uh, and in fact, when I read your book, and I mean, I was captivated, I actually thought that you managed in 38 minutes to do full justice to the richness and depth. So, I mean, that was incredible presentation. But in a sense, I thought you preempted the questions about migration by uh, foregrounding it at the beginning, saying that this is all about migration, is constitutive of all the patterns that I described urbanization, uh, changes in the way in which the region can be conceived, and so on and so forth. But I, I, don't, I didn't get that much by reading your book. So I'm sure I misunderstood uh, some of the points that you made in the book, but let me frame the question in this way. I mean, the way in which you presented migration, discuss migration in this presentation, it seemed to me exceptional to the region, contrary to the uh, desire to move away from the exceptionalism of the region. I mean, it's a region that uniquely has 90% of the population in some countries, over 50% migrants, etc., etc. So I wanted to use this as a way of introducing the topic of migration in this discussion and uh, hear your comments about that. Thank you. And Fez, you wanted a question? Thanks, Adam, for the excellent presentation. Um, I just had a question about um, fossil fuel-based firms and your kind of, perhaps, get you to sort of speculate a little bit on, because you think about how uh, those firms and, and, and particularly how you showed the kind of entrenchment, you know, their investments in, in the wider region and beyond, how to begin to dismantle um, <laughs> those firms, um, given, given we're, we're, we're operating in a context of climate crisis, um, and you don't associate the GCC in particular with climate change protests or anything like that, in contrast to the wider Middle East region. But I, I just wondered if you could say something more about that, because it seems to me that those fo the fossil fuel industry in, in the region is, is very is very strong. So how, how, do, how does one begin to go about challenging that? Yeah. Do we have any more questions? This is the last opportunity to ask. Uh, there is a lady up there. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much for this. Um, I'll ask it because I think you can probably make a nice segue from the question about um, post-conflict uh, mm. reconstruction in Yemen. Um, I was going to ask if you think that um, there, there may be some sort of stabilizing effect that, that the GCC intervention sort of economically reinvesting in construction, should there be any sort of semblance of peace in, in Yemen in the coming years? Um, so if there would be any sort of stabilizing effect or hope for that, and then if yes or even if there's some sort of degree to that, um, what would the implications be on East Africa, specifically in the Horn? Um, if you look at like control of Hodeida and how that would affect sort of the, the Red Sea project and how that relates to sort of another um, uh, migration flow if you look between Somalia and Yemen, what the implications would be for that. Thanks. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll start with the Yemen. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right that they're, they, <coughs> they are, you know, they are profiting from conflict, um, and not just in Yemen, but, but more, more broadly. Um, and there's various ways in which this, this takes place. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's not just these private conglomerates, it's also uh, the weapons sales that take place, large amount from the UK, obviously, to, um, to the Saudis and, and others in the region. Um, but at some point, uh, there is going to be uh, an end to the, like the, the war. Uh, whether this is, I mean, I don't want to speculate when this might be. Um, and I think it's important to see that what happens after the war, after the kind of violence physical violence ends in continuity with the actual aims of the war itself. Um, that we see kind of the, 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 uh, uh, the actors who are engaging in this war now trying to jostle for an outcome uh, that will be beneficial to their regional interests post when, when the shooting actually stops. Um, now, that's what I mean by, uh, if you like, profiting from the from the conflict. Um, now, the other side to it is, and this is, Yemen is a very good example because it's Saudi and the UAE are the ones who are bombing the country. Uh, it's right on their borders. Um, you can see that they've taken over key infrastructure points 
uh, in the last uh, few years already. Uh, but if you think about where is the post-conflict post funding going to come from? Uh, yes, it will come from the World Bank and other, other places, but it's also going to come from large regionally owned uh, uh, banks, like the Islamic Development Bank, um, like the Kuwaiti Development Fund, like the Abu Dhabi Development Fund, you know, these kinds of large sovereignly owned funds um, as a financing mechanism. Uh, who is going to be doing the, uh, the rebuilding uh, for roads, for net, uh, infrastructure networks, for, for hospitals, for schools? Uh, it's not only going to be Gulf firms, uh, but I think especially if the Gulf ends up being politically having a major say in what happens post-conflict, uh, I think it's very likely that they're going to be, if not for the fact that they are the major firms that are operating in these sectors already. Um, and they're already, I mean, these, th there's already this kind of uh, aid that is flowing to Yemen through the Gulf. Um, that's already happening. Uh, 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 and yeah, so I, I think Yemen is, is an example. Um, I'll come back to the, your question in a second, but it's, it's a bit more complicated in the case of Syria. Uh, because in Syria, you obviously have you know, the Russian and Iranian support of the, of the regime, uh, and if the regime manages uh, to, to remain in place, uh, it's, it's quite likely that Russian and Iranian firms, particularly I think Russian uh, uh, firms, will, will be, play a major role in the reconstruction. But it's interesting to note over the last year to six months that there has been this kind of reconciliation between many of the Gulf states and, and the regime. Like, you know, I think it's Bahrain has opened up a diplomatic office now in Damascus. Um, they've been attending uh, regime-operated uh, uh, development or investment fairs that have happened um, in the last year or so, Gulf uh, thing. So I think there's an attempt by uh, both Saudi Arabia and the UAE to kind of have a say in what happens um, there. Um, Yes, uh, the, the question about um, the go, uh, workers, uh, citizens, uh, as part of this. I, I, it's, it's not, um, these, these uh, investments, they, they're not bringing GCC citizens as kind of cheap labor or, or low paid labor into these kinds of projects. Um, however, at the level of kind of the uh, executive level, uh, Yes, you can find certainly uh, citizens um, uh, as part of these, uh, these companies. One of the people I interviewed in my book um, uh, talked about this, uh, the, the C-suite, you, know, the, the, you know, the CEOs, the CFOs, this kind of uh, high-level management uh, of, of large conglomerates, and that he was saying that many of the development, many of the firms um, uh, in the Gulf now make a requirement for you, if you want to get promoted, to one of these C-suite uh, positions, you have to have done uh, a stint somewhere else in the Middle East first. Uh, uh, and once you've done that a few places, then you'll get your promotion uh, in a telecom company or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, but uh, uh, it's either local labor, most likely local labor, uh, uh, yeah, who are, who are the ones actually you know, building these projects, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, migration, yes, it's, I mean, there is a certain, I, I, I wouldn't say it's exceptional. Um, uh, uh, it is pronounced, very much more pronounced. I mean, just saying that 10% of your population has citizenship and everyone else has no viable route to ever getting citizenship is a fairly exceptional statement. Um, but many of the patterns that you see uh, in other places, migration pattern, migration, um, uh, kind of bureaucracy or control systems that you see elsewhere in the world, I think have been seen in the Gulf first. Um, so, you know, this whole idea of, uh, you know, in this country, uh, uh, citizens taking responsibility or being uh, brought in to monitor migrants um, uh, and control, you know, who, if you're a landlord, you have to check someone's uh, citizenship or, or residency status in order to be able to rent a house, for example, these kinds of things. Um, that has a long pedigree in the Gulf. Um, that kind of system where the citizens are part of the way that migration is governed uh, has a very long pedigree in the Gulf. And I think it's starting to be generalized, um, generalized elsewhere. 
what's its uh, uh, significance uh, for these kinds of things? Um, I think one of the things is that you can see at moments of crisis that uh, what the Gulf has a response to economic downturn uh, that is not available in the same way to other states. So 2008 with the global crisis uh, in Dubai, a lot of uh, workers were just simply sent home. Um, you know, they were blocked, pl planes were block booked uh, and they were just put on the planes and sent home, often without getting salary and, and, and that kind of stuff. So this is not available in the same kind of way to uh, you know Spain or uh, or UK or whatever, where you where you faced with large levels of, of unemployed construction workers. Um, so it's a kind in this sense the crisis gets felt uh, uh, you know it gets displaced out of the Gulf. Um, at, I'm not saying it's a way of completely overcoming crisis, but it is a way of dealing with crisis to some degree. And in Saudi Arabia, that's what's happening today. Uh, you see like million, literally millions of people getting deported from Saudi Arabia over the last few years, uh, migrant workers. Um, okay, uh, fossil fuels, uh, yes, <clears throat> this is a very important question. Uh, and, you know, all what I've said shouldn't be in any way meant to imply that uh, uh, the fossil fuels are, are not still key linchpin of, of these, these states. Um, and you're absolutely right that there's a lot of, uh, lot of Aramco, for Saudi Aramco, you know, is, is a classic example. Uh, it's one of the major polluters uh, globally, responsible for, there was a report that came out last week about um, who is responsible for climate uh, carbon uh, production globally, private and state-owned firm. Saudi Aramco uh, was on top of the list. Um, you know, be more than Exxon or more than, you know, these large uh, Western oil, oil firms. Um, so they are, but they're much less part of the discussion about in, in climate change politics, I think. You're, you're right to identify that. Um, and uh, I think what's also interesting, though, is the last, uh, last few years has seen a lot of these uh, uh, firms, again, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, making inroads into renewable energy um, and, uh, you know, uh, wind, water, desalination, these kinds of projects, uh, solar energy in a big way. Um, so, the, you know, there's a company called Aqua, which is a Saudi company, which is a big, uh, you know, in, in re renewable energy uh, company and very active um, across the region. Um, so they're, they're trying to also, uh, you know, take a take a stake into this kind, these emerging um, renewable energy markets, um, uh, mostly Saudi and the UAE in that respect. Uh, and finally, uh, stabilization. Um, I, I wouldn't call it stabilization effect. Um, I think that uh, unless, like I said, unless the position of these countries are challenged and their role in the region is challenged, then uh, it may mean a formal end to, you know, day-to-day -day violence and conflict, but it's not long-term, um, it's not a good uh, scenario in, in somewhere like uh, Yemen. Uh, like I was saying, I think a lot of Yemen is about, to, is about the Horn of Africa, uh, East, East, East Africa, Red Sea, um, and the routes um, that, uh, the trade routes uh, that, are, that are part of um, the One Belt, One Road. So you see this kind of interesting both rivalry uh, as well as collaboration um, between Gulf states and China uh, in, uh, in that area. Uh, so you see, for example, in Djibouti, where China set up its first overseas military base um, ever, uh, you see UAE companies trying to operate ports there in ri rivalries with uh, Chinese uh, firms. Um, in other uh, African, Horn of Africa uh, states, you see this kind of competition around um, who is going to control port infrastructure and military infra infrastructure. Um, but at the same time, you see the Gulf making a very uh, open and explicit uh, 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 engagement with, um, with, with, China, with China, both at the state level and also um, at, the, at the commercial level, much more than it was, say, two years ago. So, it, it, yeah, this I think is very important to kind of think about as we move forward.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Adam. Can we have a big round of applause for Adam and for Jeff?